The last part is to ask the question, so what's the big assumption? The big assumption is the story that is driving it. It's the narrative that we live by. It's the thing that says, this is really important because this. So what I want you to think about is this part. What's the big assumption? What's the piece um, that it's, it's usually it's laden with emotion. It's usually connected to our fears. It's, um, it's invariable. And here's, there's this little piece at the bottom that says this. That's a little way of doing it. Um, how, how to get the big assumption? Add or remove a knot from above and fill in the blank. If I don't attend to my church, then what will happen? If I am not a good steward about my valuable time, then what will happen? If, I'm, if my church does not have my priority or my heart, what will happen? If I'm not trusting and invested in my people, then what will happen? And write down the things like this. Give me a few more minutes to do that. If you get stuck on this, the other way to think about this is to frame it this way. What is the catastrophe that I think will happen if I don't look at this way? Irrational. It's usually irrational, but you know, you, I, I, you can decide if it is or not. Maybe you'll, I've had people look at me and say, this is not irrational, this is what will happen. Okay, so what is the catastrophe? Give you just another minute or so. Okay, so Frank, if I start with you. If, what's, the, what's the big assumption behind this? And if I don't serve my people, they will not know God and I will not be living the calling that God has called me to. So I will not be doing what God wants me to do in my life. And therefore, and John said, you have a, a, a Savior complex. I said, no, I have a John the Baptist complex because I don't think that I'm a Savior. I just feel like I'm the one who has to point everyone to the Savior. Good. And without me, for some reason, they won't find it or something. If I don't attend to my people, I'm going to fail at my call. Yeah. That's how huge. Bill, what's the catastrophe? In my experience, there is little relationship between a healthy congregation and the life of the presbytery. Okay. In my experience. And so the catastrophe for me would be I'm a closet congregationalist. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. The, the, right. Part of it is like, look, here's the thing. Here's the thing about this. If I, I could invest in this presbytery thing, and it'll have absolutely no relevance to what to my congregation whatsoever. It'll be an utter waste of my time. I will I will neglect this congregation. Do I get an amen? <laughs> okay. So the so the, you know what's the big assumption? There's no there's there's uh, the big assumption is. Um, the, the, there's little little relationship between a healthy congregation and the life of the presbytery. You don't say there's a healthy presbytery, therefore all the congregations are getting it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the congregations that are healthy may or may not be related to the presbytery. In the, I mean, the real lifeblood. Do you want to tweak that any other way? Is that yes. This NCD will not survive if I don't present my life to. Oh. <laughs> And I think there's a huge assumption right in the middle of this that almost all of us seem to carry about Presbytery, which is what really matters is the Presbytery doesn't really affect my congregation. What matters is our congregations. Let's look for things that will cast doubt on the big assumption. Let's find, I mean, this is one of the, one of the parts I love about Bill's statement, is that he's got this experience. Almost all of our big assumptions are grounded in experience. But one of the parts that we probably never have experienced is how could a healthy presbytery actually contribute to health of churches? Let's go look for places where we see that happening. Let's celebrate when that is happening. Let's pay attention to the fact that there is, there is the beginning of partnership and relationship and friendship, and there's enough of it in this room that you guys all said yes to do this. So how can we begin to cast doubt on these things that we think are so important? When you start implementing change, what you start going after is the competing commitments. And the huge issue to hold on to is that change is always about competing commitments. It's always about competing values. 
And the key thing to remember about competing values is competing values are never, ever, ever solved with win-win. Something's going to lose. Even if it's one, one A. One of the hardest things to come to grips with is that. And how do how we move through the loss of that? If we're really going to be committed to our Presbyterian, it's going to cost us some stuff. 